happy St. Patty's Day, everyone, and welcome to our March Lunch Bunch. It's uh, great to see you all. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Andy Flynn, class of 86 and 98. I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement here at Mines. And if this is your first Lunch Bunch, welcome. And for those of you who are regular attendees, thank you for your continued interest and support, and welcome back. Um, we're glad to have with us today, I have you with us today as we continue our monthly look at the people and programs that make minds great. Uh, we are pleased today to welcome Dr. Robert Braun, who leads our graduate program in advanced energy systems. AES is a unique cohort based program currently enrolling over 60 graduate students, including 25 PhD candidates engaged in cutting edge energy research under the guidance of MINES faculty, as well as research mentors at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL. The program is designed to offer an array of academic and experiential opportunities that allow graduate students from diverse STEM backgrounds to develop additional STEM depth and interdisciplinary breadth focused on advancing global energy transitions. <coughs> Before Dr. Braun begins, a few quick reminders, as we do each month. Uh, any questions that you submitted with your RSVP have been shared with our speaker. And if you think of a question during the program, please feel free to use the chat function, and I'll keep an eye on that. And if we run out of time and don't get to your question, we'll circle back with you after the program. All of our Lunch Bunch programs are recorded and can be accessed on the Lunch Bunch page of the alumni website at weare.minds.edu. So if you missed one, want to listen again, or would like to share the program with a friend, go to the bottom of this page and see the complete archive of recordings. Lastly, if you have ideas for future speakers or topics, we want to know about them, just please contact me, Ruth, or anyone in the alumni office with your suggestions. And because of St. Patrick's Day, and I told Ruth I would, <clears throat> I do have some green. <laughs> and with that, welcome Dr. Braun. All right, thank you, Andy. Uh, very festive. Um, yeah, again, my name is Rob Braun. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering, and uh, I been the director of the Mines NREL AES graduate program um, for coming up on, you know, it's about a year now. And so I've been really privileged uh, uh, to run this program. And today I'm going to share with you, um, you know, what the program is about, but also some context for what's motivating um, the need even for this, this program. So uh, it is a uh, collaboration with the National Renewable en uh, Energy Lab. Um, the uh, subtitle, if you will, uh, about the program is Transforming Energy Through Graduate Education. While I'm the director, I am very much uh, supported uh, by Dr. Valerie Holt, who is the administrative director at, uh, at Mines, and Dr. Adam Warren, who's the co-director uh, of the program at, at NREL. He also serves as the director of the Accelerated Deployment and Decision Support Center. But we constitute uh, the leadership uh, of the program with both Mines and NREL uh, representatives. So this is just a, a, a few pictures um, around how we're trying to build the future energy workforce um, through really leveraging mines strengths uh, as well as NREL. The picture uh, in the upper left is uh, a picture that we took uh, at the start of the previous year. Um, and you can see roughly the number of, uh, of students. It's, it's grown since, uh, since then. Uh, but we're in our fourth year and just entering the fourth year, this joint program is really aimed at doctoral level research as well as master's coursework uh, to 
address the full complexity of tomorrow's energy, economic, and infrastructure challenges. The students have the opportunity to work uh, at NREL on site, as well as at mines, using both of our state-of-the-art tools and you know, facilities. They get to network with leaders uh, at both institutes, as well as more broadly at, through conferences and, and interactions of DOE and, uh, and other sponsors and collaborators. And it's an inter interdisciplinary effort. So one thing that I think is important to recognize is why an advanced energy systems program. Uh, the problems in this century are multidimensional and transdisciplinary in nature. We are in the midst of uh, various kinds of energy transitions that are happening at different paces and in different sectors. Uh, they involve resources, infrastructure, economics and policy, environment and so forth. Um, as I tend to tell my students, you know, the easy stuff's been done. Um, the, you know, building out uh, internal combustion engines and getting them to work at high efficiency, this, uh, while the vehicles themselves today may be the most engineered um, device on the planet, uh, we are moving to other drive systems as well. Um, and in some sense, the 21st century is, is going to be, in my opinion, characterized by some complexity and systems integration of technologies that are going to be needed um, to uh, generate the solutions um, uh, for um, and, and systems level thinking that are going to be needed to solve some, some of the energy and environment issues where we are beginning to face. So my view is that workable systems are no longer uh, enough. Uh, things like optimization are prerequisite to come into the marketplace. Um, uh, and we also need a holistic view that might involve things like cradle to grave uh, examinations of, of different um, uh, technologies and pathways uh, that might be used um, uh, to deploy new products. And so, uh, Often now we get just as many questions on, I have some kind of resource, maybe it's a biogas stream. And the question is, what do I do with it? Do I burn it? Do I run it through a fuel cell to generate uh, electricity? Uh, should I separate it in, in uh, capture CO2 and use uh, methane or, or convert it to bio, uh, a more pure biomethane resource? We need people who can answer those questions just as much as we need people who can go in and look at microstructures of electrodes and develop new materials and catalysis sets. And so we need this full spectrum. Uh, so we're working on uh, the multidisciplinary team aspect. Uh, of course, um, once you hit a certain technical threshold, your ability to um, succeed in the marketplace then becomes um, dependent on soft skills around leadership, communication, organizational skills, et cetera. And we are also working at making sure our graduates in professional degrees have those skills so that they can succeed uh, beyond simply the technical uh, litmus test of being able to hold the job in the first place. If we look at the trends, I think you know you, you you've all seen these trends of, about environmental drivers across the landscape of different sectors such as transportation. Um, we're also seeing that in heavy uh, uh, industry in terms of um, uh, container ships, heavy trucking, um, with Myersk, uh, for example, targeting zero carbon emissions by 2050. We're also seeing some 40 municipalities and cities around the U.S. banning natural gas, in, at least in new buildings, some municipalities banning it entirely. Um, who knows if, if they'll be able to meet their, their energy demands with uh, electrification of, of building energy um, uh, systems, for example. But uh, those are where the trends are headed, uh, like it or not. And you can see things like hydrogen, uh, lots of talk around hydrogen, and even in, in Golden, where Andrew Kors and, and his uh, company still had composites has seen storage tank quotations rise. Uh, from as little as 2 million in, I don't know, maybe 2014, 15 to now 450 million uh, uh, last year. And uh, things like small gas turbine markets have, have cratered 
uh, in the last few years. They've rebounded some, but uh, you can see um, some of the writings on the wall as we look at what's happening in these sectors, including uh, different drivetrains for, for ships around fuel cell systems and, and then, of course, running fuel cells in reverse as, out, as electrolyzers to make hydrogen. All of these are where we see things uh, happening. Um, and this movement towards decarbonization, if you will, is, is one in which there's a growing electrification of, uh, across the energy sectors. And that tends to create a more interconnected energy system. Um, and when you have more interconnected and more renewables, you, you may be familiar, you get this duck curve and where you have lots of solar, for example, PV, uh, uh, electric energy generation during the high points of when the sun is shining, and then uh, because all of that is installed uh, on the grid, um, that begins to uh, decrease as the sun sets. And of course the evening loads uh, uh, um, increase and, and these power plants that are base loading need to ramp up. And so um, we're, we're very much looking towards how do we transition to, um, uh, or, and furthermore, what is it we're transitioning to? So we need, we need workforce and, and, and experts and professionals who can begin to answer sensibly and, and, and rational approaches towards how we deal with these, these new energy systems. Um, more recently here in the United States as well, uh, there's been lots of talk around hydrogen hubs and accelerating towards a, uh, what we might call a, a lower carbon uh, future. Um, the Mountain West states have signed a member, uh, memorandum of understanding to develop a regional clean hydrogen hub. Um, so this has a, a fair amount of uh, investment being made. Um, perhaps uh, this uh, in, in hydrogen is, is being viewed as a, as a low cost grid balancing solution for putting renewables on the grid. That means we want to generate it from multiple resources, perhaps stored in tanks, perhaps stored in underground caverns. Uh, geologic sites where mines uh, has uh, traditional expertise in as well. We're also doing that with carbon capture and utilization as well through various mines initiatives. Beyond these, the heavy industry around things like green steel production is looking to replace um, fossil fired uh, blast furnaces uh, with electric arc furnaces. Uh, electric arc, arc furnaces are often fed with uh, uh, you know, recycled uh, steel. Um, sometimes you can't uh, really um, meet um, the steel uh, demand um, using recycled materials and you'll have to go get iron ore supply. Um, and these are usually fired um, with uh, um, fossil fuels. And so one, aspect that is also being examined is using hydrogen uh, as a reducing agent in new shaft furnaces combined with recycles of, of electric arc furnaces which have huge electric uh, power demands. Um, and this is relevant certainly for decarbonization targets, it's relevant for green steel production. Um, there are various entities out there in consortia that are looking for fossil free steel. And our own Evraz in Pueblo is one of those who's very much engaged um, in, in looking towards the future. Uh, and they have uh, uh, recently produced uh, or, or targeted um, 150 megawatts of PV panels at their uh, steel mill location to help uh, drive these electric arc furnaces. And there's also the Net Zero Steel Initiative through Rocky Mountain uh, Institute in Colorado. So a lot, of, a lot of forcing functions, if you will, that are happening in the space, not only for the steel centers, we have three now steel centers at mines and in, in the heavy industries, also around mining. And so mining design and operations are, are really becoming system level problems. Uh, for the increasing pressure on low cost uh, iron ore, copper, lithium, gold mines, um, and, and are targeting uh, net zero emissions. Uh, so these are um, where the workforce uh, is needed. Um, and we're already beginning to look at clean energy uh, mining operations, opportunities, challenges, and approaches 
uh, in collaboration with NREL and our own uh, faculty at Mines. Uh, furthermore, uh, Fortescue um, uh, Metals Group, uh, the fourth largest producer of iron ore, uh, has signaled they will be investing in carbon neutral technologies, fully transitioning within less than 10 years now. Um, they are looking to set up a technology innovation hub, possibly in Colorado. Uh, we've been working with the Colorado Energy Office, the Governor's Office, and all the, the uh, uh, Colorado institutions uh, to um, encourage them to come here and, and do such a hub. So there's this idea of electrification with renewable energy, and as it moves to serve those electrons to different end sectors that involve transportation, uh, uh, high process heat in industry feedstocks. Um, how are we going to do this? And if we have cheap electrical energy, uh, that can open up the doors for all kinds of new, uh, um, that is a feedstock for, for different kinds of, of production. Uh, we could make gas and drop it into uh, natural gas pipelines and blend through power to gas routes. We could store it in underground caverns. Um, we can take uh, recycled CO2 and develop fuels and chemicals. These are the new paradigms that, that we are beginning to uh, face as we look ahead to what the rest of the century holds. And these, uh, the electrification of these sectors does complicate the supply and demand picture across um, the various sectors. So our program vision at AES is to kind of shape some of this energy transition and provide the workforce that is leading to uh, um, um, and, and is needed um, through uh, a collaboration with the National Renewable Energy Lab, looking for research placements and rotations through the different laboratory groups. If depending on how you're familiar with it, they have a biomass, thermal chemical, and, and biochemical energy conversion group. Of course, they have PV, wind. Uh, uh, and concentrating solar. Um, and so our, our plan is, is working with them where, uh, at least at the graduate level, there are PhD thesis that are co-supervised by MINES faculty and NREL staff. Um, and there are also uh, master's thesis, professional degree core courses where in which they take um, a, core a course based non-thesis opportunity emphasizing energy technologies and also being exposed to the policy and economic dimensions of the energy challenge. And so that looks at things like business models for how energy is transported and stored. How does the grid work with pricing? Um, and then how do the economics and policy govern um, and influence uh, these business models? And that involves uh, them looking at things at a big picture uh, and as you'll see also, uh, um, this big picture rests on what we would call fundamental uh, science, technology, and engineering and mathematics as well. So the whole STEM effort of, of the research is at the core, yet we need our students to climb the ladder and understand the context um, for the problems they're working on in, in their own research. This energy-related R&D is also informed by a policy. So uh, you may be familiar with Morgan Bazillion running the Payne Institute for public policy. Um, lots of different um, influences. Um, Morgan has the deepest Rolodex I've ever seen. Um, knowing all the major players as board members from uh, leading energy companies, leading mining companies, as well as folks from Stanford um, and some of the leader, leading uh, thinkers and thought leaders in the space. And our students get to attend these lectures and seminars uh, from the Public Policy Institute, as well as uh, Morgan uh, co-teaches the Energy Policy and Economics course that's in our core program. So our aim is cutting edge research and, and new workforce prepared professionals. Um, and that's through two degree levels, the PhD, which is really a four-year program and an MS course-based uh, program. That's one and a half year program, which combines the STEM depth with an interdisciplinary breadth. Um, the point here is to leverage the traditional strengths of mines across its core disciplines of geology, uh, mining materials, um, physics, and, and uh, thermal fluids and chemical engineering, for example, and, and mechanical engineering. 
is, and so currently um, we have around 25 PhD students and 35 master's students. Um, we will continue to grow. Next year we'll reach our full strength of PhD students. Uh, it should be approaching 65 to, to 70 students uh, overall. Um, and by the way, from the audience, you can feel free to jump in at any point if you have some questions. I, I'm happy to take this in an informal setting as well. Um, and you can, so you can feel free to stop me and, and I can try to answer any questions. Um, but we're working to ensure, you know, we have a high skilled uh, energy workforce. And that means helping define new careers. Uh, and how do we define new careers? That's an interesting question uh, to think about. And I think the answer is partly to throw these students at what are the new problems. And by throwing the students at what are the new problems, you begin to develop and fill uh, new career spaces, whether it's in renewable energy planning, whether it's in energy planning at a systems level, whether it's in infrastructure, looking at expanding um, natural gas pipelines in, in, in terms of their ability for hydrogen compatibility or transitioning to hydrogen pipelines from remote locations to the city gate. Uh, looking at the problem holistically from a life cycle assessment and the energy and the environmental impact um, to simply retraining and upskilling the current workforce who may be from the oil and gas sector and who are looking to make career transitions. And so we can do that through certificate programs, um, uh, for example, and online programs. So that uh, program that we're envisioning offering career development through a continuum, um, through the PhD, offering PhD and MS uh, degrees, but also retraining, as I just said, focus on certificates in industry specific online uh, courses, perhaps short courses is generally how we do it at Mines in eight, eight week uh, intervals. Right now, we haven't stood up this component of it, but this is part of our future vision. And then looking through things like National Science Foundation and industrial internships uh, that allow us to uh, do outreach at the K through 12 level and the community level as well. So to give you a feel for what exactly is the research, what are we talking about in these programs? Uh, some of it uh, simply amounts to looking at the new problems we're faced with and how do we give industry and working professional new tools that help us to design the energy systems of the future that have to meet the end, end use, end sector loads. So data centers are growing at a rate of 2%. They're some of the largest consumers, energy consumers um, on the planet. Uh, these installations can, can uh, need two to 300 megawatts by themselves, by the way. Uh, for large data centers. Um, and uh, folks like Microsoft have put a stake in the ground, basically saying they're going to be net zero energy supply. So how do we do that? These are the demands and how do you meet those demands? And we need tools that can look at variable energy resource supplies like wind and solar, which are not always, the wind's not always blowing, the sun's not always shining. How do we design these systems? How do we size them? What is the heterogeneous mix of base load energy supply uh, from various prime movers to renewables to meet these loads? Are we gonna take, uh, you know, from the grid? Water, of course, is getting to be a scarce resource. And so there's this nexus of water, energy, uh, and, and emissions. Um, and so we need cost optimized and environmentally optimized solutions. And so Mines and NREL have been significantly updating and enhancing uh, tools, one of which is the REOP tool. It's been done through this program uh, and beyond the AES program that looks at the drivers, um, economics, costs, incentive, utility features, uh, maximizing energy resilience for due to uh, outages uh, from harsh weather events, um, and adding things like CHP, base loading technologies, uh, that looks at things like the site demands and takes into account the user objectives of what 
any given user. It could be a building owner operator, could be a uh, could be a die casting facility or a manufacturing plant that wants to find out what array of technologies uh, in the context of your utility costs can they select to be competitive and yet move towards uh, a more clean energy vision. Furthermore, in the lab, things that happen at mines, for example, we have a fuel cell center. It's one of the leading fuel cell centers and, and electrochemical centers uh, in the world. Uh, how do we move from the technologies that are being developed in the lab and scale up to give solutions fast? And so there's a tech transfer component is there, and that involves uh, modeling fundamentally, uh, doing process systems in engineering and techno-economics. And, and these are the things we want our students to go, to span the breadth uh, of, of fundamentals all the way out to the system techno-economic view. Um, so some of the example projects um, that are currently ongoing and Jeffrey Gifford, he's looking at uh, new ways to take renewable energy and take particles, uh, sand particles and heat them up. So what you do is you take excess electrons and you just heat up sand up to 900 C and store them in huge silos. This is an example where of a technology that you could to repower or retrofit coal power plants and make use of all that stranded capital for ranking power plants, uh, for example, steam power plants. And instead of firing coal, you take excess renewable energy, you heat particles up, you store the thermal energy and you dispatch that through that same capital uh, cost you've had previously in a steam or Brayton cycle uh, power plant. And you would discharge those high temperature particles in a heat exchanger and um, then fire, if you will, through heating up air uh, or steam uh, um, uh, and generate electricity. Kate Anderson, recently the first minted PhD student out of the program, uh, was leading the, a lot of the reopt uh, reformulation effort that led to looking at different kinds of technologies integrated together. Uh, to produce minimum cost uh, solutions. Uh, cohort two uh, PhD student uh, Amog Thate, he's been working with me in mechanical engineering, joined the AES program. He's looking at the economic uh, and technical aspects of integrating uh, electrolyzers uh, on the grid. And so there are programs with Excel, uh, for example, that's looking at high temperature electrolysis, integrating it with nuclear energy, and putting electrons out on the grid, uh, taking electrons from the grid and making hydrogen. Uh, Dr. Uh, Braun? Yeah. Just uh, had a had a question pop up and I, I thought I'd throw it out there uh, was, um, are there any focuses on microgrids for community or small areas to ensure energy stability? Yeah, so Dr. Paulo Tabarez, we're working with in, out of mechanical engineering. He's part of the uh, AES, uh, Mines faculty uh, who's working on microgrids and distributed energy for community based um, programs. Um, Mines is looking, you know, at some of their new buildings that we'll be resurrecting to instrument them up and study ways of, um, of using phase change materials and different distributed energy resources in a, in a uh, synergistic way. Um, and we've got some proposals in that involve AES, the AES program, um, Department of Energy connected communities um, um, funding opportunities, um, as well as through the Sloan Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. So the answer is yes, and it's it's it, it's an active area right now. I won't show anything on that now, uh, but yes, we are doing that. Um, we are working, uh, students have the opportunity to visit full-scale installations and help them with their engineering problems. This is the Crescent Dunes site in Tonopah, Nevada. We students uh, at Mines have visited many times um, in which were, um, uh, this is a full-scale 110 megawatt power plant that has uh, molten salt uh, energy, thermal energy storage tanks, um, and you can see the, the students and, and the faculty and NREL researchers looking at novel molten salt steam uh, um, uh, boilers 
uh, that have to deal with things like thermal shock, thermal stress, um, as they as this power plant cycle. Um, and we're helping them optimally dispatch the thermal energy for maximum revenue uh, for these kinds of sites, as well as looking at some of the uh, engineering challenges of dynamic operation. Um, and so this is leveraging a lot of mines expertise, uh, both thermally from an operations research uh, collectively with, um, with uh, our, our students. Um, the aim is a breath on top of depth of, uh, approach. Um, and uh, so to give you an example, this is a um, uh, more of a chemical engineering process engineering project, which was looking at fast paralysis of biomass. And so that one of the challenges that the NREL folks were having is they need a process engineering model that is gonna look, take biomass um, and produce um, pyrolysis vapors, which can then be vapor phase upgraded uh, to liquid fuels uh, from biomass in a biorefinery. But they don't really know how to design um, uh, the fluidized bed reactor. And so uh, Anna Trendowitz, student of mine, uh, was working at uh, a, a reactor design, one dimensional reactor design model that took into account all the chemical kinetics and the process engineering and the, and the computational fluid dynamics uh, to help come up with a model that they could drop in uh, to this process flow sheet and um, use it for plant engineering analysis. And so she was involved in doing experiments uh, on small scale things, um, just little biomass uh, uh, and, and looking at the char and, and the vapors that would come off in a small rig to modeling um, uh, at the MISO scale, um, and then process systems engineering. So an example of students climbing the ladder to get breath on top of depth. Um, and so that approach can be done through, here's an example of modeling where we might take what material scientists are doing with small electrochemical cells, scaling it up to see how these cells would perform at scale and getting kilowatt scale uh, stack test data for electrochemical stacks, and then building a plant around that and examining what is the techno-economics from energy use, cost of the product out to water and, water and emissions, which might then be used to look at things like life cycle assessment, which is an environmental uh, look at, at the technology from cradle to grave. And so we can have students play around at this scale but we want them to climb up the ladder to look at the, the landscape of what they're doing uh, to better inform um, uh, their expertise as well as be more impactful once they get to uh, industry. And so the, the, there's a whole wide variety of topics. This is just some list of what the first 13 PhD students were doing. And they get an abundance of professional growth opportunities through exposure to different national labs, different universities and collaborators that are on the project, and of course, many different industry folks. Uh, and often the students themselves are the ones who are giving out the, um, you know, the quarterly project reports to the funders or the collaborating uh, um, institutions. This is just a small NASCAR uh, snapshot. We probably give 20 slides worth of, of examples of, of the different partners uh, in industry um, and, and, and both in labs and, and universities. The program itself um, is a 30 credit based uh, program for courses for the master's students, for the PhD students at 72 credit hours. Um, and um, uh, if the students come through with a master's already, of course, uh, they can use that and apply it towards a PhD program. The way it works is uh, in year one, they take uh, a number of courses around energy resources and, and the fundamental physics of energy conversion. They look at energy for transportation, for example, and then the PhD students get involved in uh, a grad seminar um, and then in, in the spring, they take an energy economics and policy course and an energy systems integration course. Uh, for the PhD students, they're learning about uh, the activities over at NREL, interfacing with potential men mentors. Um, and the MS students have opportunities for NREL internships. 
As it stands, we're trying to improve the connectivity of the, uh, the uh, master student experience with NREL and in the clean energy landscape uh, for connecting them with internship opportunities. Uh, that's a work in progress, uh, but there are many uh, master's not thesis students at NREL who are at MINES uh, doing internships. Um, in the end, uh, the AES PhD student uh, is advised by both uh, a MINES academic advisor and an NREL mentor, and this forms um, uh, the, the research cohort, if you will, for one student. And we have this uh, um, targeting for 28 um, uh, PhD students to have this arrangement in the program. It's worth about 2 million per year in revenue at MINES, this program, a large portion of which is funded by NREL. Um, we spend that first year matching the students with their interests and as well as with the advisors and mentors and the project opportunities. And there are lots of different uh, opportunities from energy storage to looking at geothermal, electrochemical activities, um, material science, water resources, wind, bioenergy, and they span um, you know, fundamental science to uh, more larger scale laboratory efforts. Um, the array of topics and advisors is, can be a little dizzying uh, with what's out there. A lot of what our leadership does is, is try to build these relationships and uh, make these connections to, to students and staff. And here's, there's many ways you could look at it. You could look at it in this way, uh, I put together this to, to look across the MINES faculty through the departments, looking at their expertise and catalysis, uh, financing, building energy, electrochemical systems, the physics group and you know, semiconductors with who the NREL uh, groups are and who the experts were over there with what the research topics are from solar cells to grid, grid integration to new areas like agrivoltaics, for example. So um, the way we think, you know, Minds alumni and friends can help support uh, uh, this venture uh, is we're trying to make it more sustainable by, um, you know, governmental support, but also through foundation support. Um, and in the way folks like yourself could could participate would be through an advisory role uh, to come in to be a guest speaker to share what you're seeing and hearing to make connections uh, for internships for master students. Uh, as well. Um, there's also opportunities for master's student scholarship support. Uh, currently, uh, the AES program really only funds the PhD students. It turns out that so many students are interested in this program that this AES program has become the fourth largest uh, graduate application uh, across mines. So, uh, you know, the only folks higher are computer science and mechanical engineering. Uh, and maybe chemical engineering. So we stand above a lot of the, all the other departments in the number of applicants. And one of the things that's happening with the interdisciplinary graduate programs that are on campus, they're on the leading edge uh, of getting more and more applicants that uh, in fact are outpacing many of the departments. Uh, but we need things like student scholarship support to continue to strengthen the program. And so we're looking to raise money to support various levels of scholarship support for entering MS students. Sometimes they don't choose mines because mines can be a little expensive. If, if we can have one to two thousand dollar scholarships that can offsort, uh, offset some of their, um, um, uh, you know, their, their, their tuition burden that helps. We're also doing summer research experiences. This summer we're doing uh, uh, an Ireland trip um, and Sloan has uh, been funding uh, these travels. Uh, we're looking through the gold mine um, um, uh, kind of cloud share uh, funding mechanism to raise uh, money for uh, future trips and to supplement the funding for cultural exchange. Then, of course, there's always dedicated program support um, through the alumni base um, that we're that we're looking uh, uh, to build out. So um, in particular, next week, uh, uh, the AES cohorts are launching a campaign on Goldmine, the official crowdfunding uh, uh, platform for mines. Our primary goal is to raise money for graduate students to attend 
uh, important summer research experience in Ireland, uh, where they're going to look at wind and how Ireland as an island nation is dealing with transitioning to renewable energy um, and in things like uh, their technologies, um, their grid interconnectedness, um, and also generating things like hydrogen. Um, also, we're trying to raise awareness about uh, this AES program. And so Ali Dugdale will be sharing a link to our campaign uh, once it's live. Um, and so I hope you've enjoyed this uh, snapshot of what's happening at Mines through this program and happy to take any, any questions. Yeah, I have an initial question, uh, Dr. Braun from uh, William uh, Grovier, and, and it was, does the AAS program grant its own degrees or are they still with the traditional departments? Yeah, so like most interdisciplinary programs, the, um, the professional degrees are literally stated on the diploma, a degree in advanced energy systems. So they're not affiliated with the departments, although the program itself, in terms of the core faculty, draws on many faculty, faculty across minds from the departments. And of course, the students need the STEM depth, and they get the STEM depth by taking the electives in the research uh, specific areas that they need whether it's in materials from fundamentals of thermodynamics of materials to chemical kinetics and reactor design to you know, advanced heat transfer from mechanical engineering. They take these courses, for example, uh, to get them the fundamental preparation they need to, to successfully execute their research. Uh, and then we use the, the AES specific courses to provide them with the breadth and the connectivity to NREP. So there's a question, let's see. Actually, it's um, not a question, it's a comment. comment. Um, so it is uh, an engineering degree um, in the end. So it's designated as an engineering degree. Um, and that's, that's how we view it. And that's how it's um, also um, uh, advertised to the students. Any other questions out there? It's a lot of innocent. Dr. Brown, not, not a question, Andy, but just a statement. Uh, certainly really appreciate the information today. Energy is not what it used to be. That's obvious. And the uh, ever expanding world really needs this kind of work. So it's great to see that Mines is at the forefront of these energy discussions, uh, true to their, their past history and all. Um, it, it, from my perspective, more understanding even internal on campus, um, let alone the, the mines community, uh, would really benefit by understanding this. So I, I appreciate you spending time with us today and encourage us to do more uh, getting that word out. Yeah, I appreciate that, uh, Bill. Uh, one, one of the things that is on my to-do list is I need to go to each of the departments and give this presentation. Um, many know about it, have heard about it, but what is needed is to, the linkages and the logistics and how do you actually you know, get involved. And internally, we, we also have our own you know, kind of bureaucratic challenges of how they're funded and, and how the faculty who advise get credit. These are all the things that are kind of on the operations level that, um, um, yeah, we're working on as we speak. Yeah. Grover, good to see you. Got a question. Hi, Rob. Nice <laughs> presentation. Thank you very much. Hey, a follow on question. So if, uh, if a PhD or master's student has, gets a degree in AES, an engineering degree in AES, that's not gonna mean anything to an employer, uh, as opposed to say a, a PhD in mechanical engineering, which everybody would recognize. So how, how are your graduate students, interdisciplinary graduate students going to educate their employers, their future employers? 
Yeah, so that's a great question. It's one we used to have the same issue um, when you remember that mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, et cetera, didn't even have their own departments, right? And we had what we were was a service that eventually grew into degrees uh, from the engineering division. And, um, and uh, students did have to spend some time explaining that they basically had a degree in the mechanical specialty. So my vision uh, for this, um, I would love to hear, you know, is, is incomplete, let me, let me just say. I would love to hear your thoughts about how best to do that because it, one of the ways we traditionally have done it is you put bullets, right, in your resume and, and you say what your, your core focus area might be, like maybe you're AES, but you have all these chemical engineering background. Um, and so you do have to explain. And we haven't had any trouble as of yet for students getting jobs, but they're only beginning to matriculate. And, and so, um, yeah, I'd love to hear uh, the alumni thoughts on, on how to manage that. Um, but it's also one that all the IGPs face because we have almost 20 of them uh, on campus now. Um, so collectively, um, I think that would be a great topic for the uh, uh, Associate Dean of Graduate Studies to, to also weigh in on, as well as to hear what our alumni think about how we massage this, so to speak, or uh, message these degrees. So Dr. Braun, I, I, had a, I was curious about, because uh, these are pretty complex ideas, they're new, new energy systems or um, maybe modified or improved uh, energy systems and, and need to be scaled, you know, from where you're looking at them. What is, what kind of ramp up time are you looking at? I mean, are we looking at things that might be viable in five years, 10 years, three years? What, what is the, the thought behind those types of processes you're looking at? Well, um, you know, as I stated, there are many companies, not only uh, those mandated through federal mechanisms, but there are many companies who are looking already transitioning. Um, so I mentioned Fortescue, they're a good example. And it's, I mentioned them in part because it's on the top of, the, my, of my mind, we hosted them. Um, they are bringing up to us and, and this is, you know, they're an Australian company. So they are talking to us about things like energy justice and where are they going to get the workforce um, to, to staff um, their company to, to, to do these challenges. And so, you know, they put a stake in the ground, um, you know, for, to be the largest green hydrogen producer. Now, to be the largest green hydrogen producer, you need large consumers. <laughs> And so uh, they're looking to places like Evraz Steel, who, you know, basically consumes 7 billion BTUs per day of natural gas just to fire the ladles and the furnaces. Um, um, and as they decarbonize, which they are looking to do as well, they're going to be a hydrogen demand. Uh, they're going to try to fire them as many as they can, of course, with electric energy, but we have trouble um, in, in these electrification of power systems because some of the batch activities have huge electrical energy demands in short amount of time. And the best way to serve those demands may not be through uh, high voltage you know, transmission lines. Uh, you need um, uh, high throughput pipelines that carry four to five times more energy than high voltage electrical lines do. Um, and that's through pipelines. And so we're gonna need to build out new infrastructure um, in this interconnected energy systems. And so how do we do that? We have wind, for example, in Wyoming, lots of it. Uh, does that mean we're gonna start co-locating uh, industrial users up there? We don't know. I don't know who knows the answer to these questions. But these are the, the problems we now face 
with how to recast uh, um, uh, these interconnected infrastructure around energy transmission, supply, demand, uh, and generation, right? So I simply don't have the answer, but these are the problems that we want to unleash these students out on um, so they can, um, you know, these are where the new careers are. And it's going to take decades, let's face it. Uh, you're looking at $180 trillion of existing energy infrastructure that will, some of which will have to undergo a transition. Um, and we don't need, in my opinion, to do all of that, but you know, I'm just simply one voice. I don't set policy. I would like to make use of the existing natural gas infrastructure that we have. We have 2.6 million miles of it in the United States. Let's start blending hydrogen. Let's look at sensible solutions to decarbonize. But folks are concerned by some, which is what you're seeing, um, uh, for example, uh, in, in some of the utilities and municipalities that are simply banning natural gas outright as a transition fuel um, without having a real solution about how they're going to do, you know, simple things like, you know, stovetop cooking. Um, and, um, you know, uh, there some people are concerned that oil and gas, you know, might uh you know, try to retard and slow down this transition and maximize profits. Um, so somehow collectively, we have to, to, to herd all of these activities in a sensible, rational way that also makes, you know, that makes economic sense, but makes environmental sense. Um, and I don't have the answers, Andy, <laughs> but we're hoping the students, when they're unleashed on this problem uh, and advised by us, can begin to develop solutions. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for your time today, Dr. Braun. And I appreciate everybody that was able to make it today for the lunch bunch. Um, if you have any questions for Dr. Braun that weren't answered, um, please send them to me or put them into the chat before you leave. Um, but we um, appreciate you being here. Appreciate you, Dr. Braun. We'll continue the lunch bunch uh, series the third Thursday of each month. And we'll look forward to having you back again next month. Thank you all for joining today and go our diggers.